said, my name is Roshi Eginton, and I'm joined here by my colleague Eileen Tormey. And from we're from Quality and Patient Safety Improvement, which is part of the National Quality and Patient Safety Directorate. So we're just going to give you a bit of a presentation today on quality improvement and leading for improvement. And it's really about engaging with people around the improvement projects that you're thinking about starting in your own services. Our key messages for today are what is quality improvement? And why do we use it? Where do we get some of our QI change ideas from, which might inspire you around your own projects? Or if you might already have a project in mind, it'll help you develop it further. <clears throat> How you can use our HSE framework for improving quality to support work and some further resources and training in quality improvement and quality and patient safety that you might like to avail of. Again, we're part of the QPS Improvement Team, which is part of the National Quality and Patient Safety Directorate. There are a number of other teams that are part of the directorate. You can see them there. QPS Intelligence, Incident Management, Education, Connect, and our National Center for Clinical Audit. And we all report into Dr. Orla Healy, who's the National Clinical Director for Quality and Patient Safety. Just to mention as well, we're more than happy to share these slides with Lucy to send out with you to you afterwards. So don't, don't feel like you need to make notes or anything. So quality improvement, what is quality improvement? As defined in our HSC framework for improving quality, we like to use the definition that you see in front of you. That is the combined and unceasing efforts of everybody, including healthcare professionals, patients, and families, to make changes that lead to better patient outcomes, better experiences of care, and continued development and supported staff. That's quite a holistic definition of QI, but there are other QI definitions out there. And one of the other popular ones applies more to the methodology of QI. And it says that QI is a systematic and a coordinated approach to solving a problem using specific methods and tools with the aim of bringing about a measurable improvement. Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna turn off my video for a second only because my bandwidth might be going, so I don't wanna drop off. So if you excuse me, there you go. Uh, then I'll just make sure that uh, I stay on. I got the same message, Roisin. It's obviously <laughs> our server. <laughs> oh God, hopefully we stay with you. So how is change implemented? Let's think about this. In the first scenario, there's a recognition that something has to be done. So there can be a lot of immediate trial and error, a bit of chaos, and in general, perhaps too much action and not enough thinking and planning for sustainability. Then in the second scenario, which you might be familiar with as well, we spend too much time thinking about what we need to do. We research it, we do detailed studies, we do planning, but we sometimes don't even get to the implementation stage. So the third scenario is the one advocated by James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits. Many of you might have read it or listened to it on an audiobook. James Clear talks about trying small incremental improvements and testing to see what works. So in the image, you see there's professional cyclists and all the small improvements from the aerodynamic shape of the helmet to the size of the saddle, and they all result in improved speed. And it's a very similar approach that we take in using quality improvement in our healthcare services. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, and Eileen is going to share, if you don't mind, a very quick video that we feel uh, gives that, actually gives that exact example of the, the British cycling team and how they used quality improvements or marginal gains to improve their own practice. Team Sky, which yeah. is Great Britain's okay. professional cycling team. Sometime in the mid 2000s, around 2010, they hired a man named Dave Brailsford. And at the time, Team Sky had a very middle of the road record when it came to performance on the world stage. They had won about one gold medal in the last 100 years from 1908 to 2008. They had never won a Tour de France, the premier event in cycling. And when they hired Dave Brailsford, they said, we would like to change this. We'd like to improve our performance. We'd like to reach a higher level of performance. What's your plan to help us do that? And when they hired Brailsford, he said, I have this strategy called the aggregation of marginal gains. And the way that he described it was the 1% improvement in nearly everything that you do. And so they started by looking at a lot of things you would expect a cycling team to look at. They improved their uh, bike tires, made them slightly lighter. They put a more ergonomic seat on the bike. They had their riders wear biofeedback sensors so they could see how each person responded to the training and practice that they did each day. They had their outdoor riders wear indoor racing suits because they were lighter and more aerodynamic. But then they did a variety of things that you wouldn't expect a cycling team to do. They split tested different types of massage gels to see which one led to the best form of recovery. 
They taught their riders how to wash their hands to reduce the risk of infection and keep them healthy. They even figured out what kind of pillow led to the best night's sleep for each rider and then brought that on the road with them to hotels. So Brailsford said, if we can actually execute on this strategy, if we can aggregate all these small changes, these little 1% improvements, then I think we can win the Tour de France in about five years. He ended up being wrong. They won the Tour de France in three years, and then they repeated again in the fourth year with a different rider. And then just last year, they won for the third time in four years. And Brailsford's strategy really came to fruition at the Olympics in London in 2012, when they won 70% of the gold medals available. And so what I'd like to start us off with is the idea that small improvements actually can add up to a very significant change in a relatively short period of time. Now, so that's what we wanted to share with you there. Um, let's go to my share and come back to the presentation. <clears throat> so it's again, it's about aggregating the incremental changes making those small incremental tests of change and letting them build and build until you can have some phenomenal results in a very short period of time. Let me go back to my presentation again. So again, QI seeks to improve by analyzing why we do things the way we do and finding better ways to do it. And the results are streamlined processes and reduction in costs because it's the same workflow, but less time. Improving documentation due to simpler processes. Better training, again, because the process is simpler. So there's an increased understanding of what's involved and improved quality as a result of all the above. This is the model for improvement, which we use as the framework to drive continuous improvement for our QPS improvement team and a lot of the other quality improvement methodologies um, that are out there use the, the model for improvement as a basis or a framework. So the model consists of two parts. The first are three questions that help us define what we want to achieve, what ideas we think might make a difference, and what we'll measure to help us understand if the change, change is an improvement rather than just a change for change's sake. The second part, the circle at the bottom, the cyclical uh, circle is the, the PDSA, the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle. That outlines the steps for the actual testing and the change ideas. The cyclical nature allows the change to be refined and improved through repeated cycles of testing and learning. And this provides the vehicle for continuous improvement. We've often had the question, how does QI differ or how is it similar to audit and research? And this is a really maybe oversimplified, but a simple way of showing what we mean by the different um, by the different areas. So research gives us what's possible. That's where you do all of your you know data collection, theorizing, hypotheses, testing. What new knowledge can we discover? What new is out there? Audit is the, the space and time where we are now. It's, it's a point in time to see how are we doing? How are we doing against indicators, against targets, against KPIs? And then QI is how can we improve from where we are to where we wanna go? So QI is kind of the movement from where we're at to where we could be. So where do we get some improvement ideas from? Um, I'm sure you can think of plenty in your own services, but some of the and more popular ones are the hunches, the patient feedback, the family's feedback, care's feedback, staff experience, subject matter experts, um, identified risks that you have in the service or issues. Clear data, your KPIs, your audits, your complaints, your compliments, analyzing those can give you some great ideas for change. Your standards, such as your HICWA standards and legal obligations. And then again, the evidence. So looking at research, published studies, conference proceedings, you know, consider looking at ideas from a different perspective or from the perspective of someone who's affected in a different way. So by using a different lens to look at QI ideas, you can always come up with a new approach. Process mapping is really popular to start off and get some change ideas. And while some people have fantastic um, programs to do process mapping in a really fancy way like MS Visio and lots of other programs, you can very simply do it using sticky notes on a whiteboard or even on the wall. So it's just a matter of uh, using um, whatever means is, is possible to you. You don't have to have the fancy software to do the process mapping. This type of exercise is also used in Lean, if you've heard of that. And it's done together as a team because that way you'll have everybody's different views on how the process actually works. 
And the important thing in process mapping, it's really important to map it as is. What's currently happening with the process, not as it should be, because as it is, is really going to show you where the wastage is. In quality improvement, we say sometimes um, the improvements are right under your nose and you may not see them because we're all so busy and improvement is often seen as an add-on rather than part of what we do. So one of the great things for, for looking for improvement ideas is look at your day-to-day, -day. look at the data you're collecting, talk to the patients you're meeting, talk to the other staff you're working with and the improvement ideas will come to you. And sometimes they come across as very obvious when you start looking for them. To implement quality improvement, we use the framework for improving quality that was published by our team a number of years ago. And it has drivers there, six drivers, um, that can help direct you in making improvement in your services. It's based on international novel, novels, uh, models and evidence, as well as some local improvement experience and learning when we tested this in a number of hospitals. We also have our quality improvement toolkit you can get on our website. It has 17 tools to support quality improvement projects. And the tools are appropriate, oh, go back. The tools are appropriate for every phase of a project, starting out with that light bulb moment, that aha moment where you go, ah, oh, I know what I want to do, and brings you right through to testing your idea, evaluating has it worked, and spreading and sustaining it if it's been successful. So we highly recommend going onto the website and checking out the tools. You may not need all 17. Use them as they're applicable to the project that you're trying. Our QI Toolkit also has a project charter, which is really good, and it helps you define your improvement project and get support. It helps coach you on, coach you on your aim statement, which we always recommend should be SMART, um, what you're trying not to do, what you are trying to do in your scope, what changes you want to make, who's going to sponsor the project, because governance is incredibly important to get um, concrete from the beginning, and where can you access advice and support. I'm going to try to share another video with you now. I don't know, Eileen, if you want to try or if you want me to try. It's a I'm going to try video. this one. I've gone directly onto YouTube, so I'm going to see if that's going to work rather than taking it down off the desktop. So Thanks, try Amelia. this for one go, okay. one chance, and that's it. Janae, then. It's only a one-minute video, but it's it's ultimately we want to make the improvements to provide safer, better care for our patients, our service users, and their families. So it could mean better outcomes for patients or a better experience for them. So we just want to share one of our patient partners for our national director team, Joan and her son, Leo. And we just want you to listen to some of the ideas that they share around how even service providers could make improvements, how we could all make improvements and how we work based on some of the suggestions that she has. Okay, I think this might work, so hopefully. Can you hear that, Roisin? My name is Joan Johnson yeah. and I'm mom to Lee, age five, living with angel man syndrome, a rare neurogenetic condition that means his care can be medically complex. A theme for this year's World Patient Safety Day is medication without harm. In our family have experienced medication safety incidents with those medications in the past. I want to take this opportunity to highlight that patient safety means different things to different people across different healthcare settings. Right now, our focus is the physical safety of Leo's environment, constantly looking around and asking ourselves, what could Leo do? You see, Leo is a curious little boy. He enjoys exploring the world around him with his hands and his mouth. Hospital visits are challenging. Leo requires constant supervision as he's a tenacious problem solver and opportunistic risk taker with zero safety awareness. Everything that Leo finds interesting must be explored in his mouth and healthcare items are particularly interesting. I remember one admission leaving Leo in his specialist seat while I went to the bathroom down the hall and I came back to find him happily chewing on the IV line that had been in his neck when I left. I fished other healthcare objects out of his mouth too. His hospital ID bracelet after he chewed it off his wrist. We have to be hyper vigilant, particularly when Leo is in new environments. So on this World Patient Safety Day, I ask you to consider, what does patient safety mean for you, the people you work with, and the people you care for? If it's the care environment like it is for us with Leo, are there hazards that can be removed or made safe? Is there a specialized bed that could be requested or a format that would make his floor exploration just a little more hygienic? 
Is the dressing or ID bracelet you're currently placing secure from curious and industrious little fingers of mine? Do you, you regularly ask mom or dad if they need a break to grab some change? Use the bathroom and just get a breath of fresh air so children like Leo are never left with unsupervised opportunities for mischief. Look around you today and think, is there anything I could do to make Leo's visit safer? Ask yourself as we do, what could Leo do? Okay, Roisin, I've given you back share there. Great, thanks, Millie and Eileen. So as Joan shared there, some great suggestions for where quality improvement ideas could come from. Um, I won't ask you to, to feedback on, on any of that, but you can reflect on it in your own time. I'm just gonna go back now to my presentation. Next. Okay. <clears throat> So when you're engaging colleagues, you have a QI, you have a quality improvement project idea, and now you want to engage um, colleagues, peers, senior staff in coming on board to, to support you in the project and perhaps work with you. Winning hearts and minds is really important to influence change. But what percentage of people do you think are more influenced by their mind to support an improvement? And what percentage of people do you think are more influenced by their heart to support an improvement? So if you want to just throw it in the chat box, Eileen will keep an eye out on the chat there. So what percentage of people more influenced by their mind and what percentage more influenced by their heart? Maybe. Any thoughts? 40% mind, 60% heart, 20% head, 80% heart, 70% mm -hmm. heart. Yeah. Well, it might surprise you to see. Another seven. Yeah. 5% and 95%. And that's based on international research in this area. So it really goes to show that when you're pitching an idea for improvement or trying to influence others, you really need to think about what matters to them. One of the other drivers for quality improvement in our framework for improving quality is the use of improvement methods. So as I mentioned before, the lean principles, you also might be familiar with Six Sigma, clinical microsystems, um, the change guide is fantastic. Uh, they have a number of improvement methods there. And that last one there, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement advocates for is the model for improvement. And that's the one that we use. The last driver for um, in the framework for improving quality I'd like to talk about today is measurement for quality. And this is often the most daunting part of a quality improvement project. How you can measure that your change made a difference and made an improvement rather than just being changed for change's sake. So measuring for improvement normally involves five steps. You decide what you're gonna measure, you collect your data and establish your baseline, then you collect your data over time, and over time is the key phrase there. You want to show the change over time as you implement the changes. You display and analyze the data, and then you present your findings. And again, as I've mentioned before, all improvement is change but not all change is improvement. So you're trying to show, again, the change over time that your idea has made to improve the service that you're working with. Here's a sample run chart. Again, um, the data nervous would run screaming from this and people who are, have an aversion to Excel often are quite nervous, but you could actually do a run chart on uh, the back of a piece of paper. They don't have to be fancy and um, they don't have to be uh, the, the most beautifully organized Excel charts in history. What you really want to get is the main elements. So firstly, the baseline. That's the data you collected to show the current situation. It could be based on an audit. Ideally, it should have five data points. So this could be depending on your project, a data point for every hour, every day, or every week. That's just your starting point. The goal line there you can see is annotated is the result you're aiming for. And then you start plotting your actual data over time as you collect it. 
those annotations in the chart really important so you can see where there's a peak or a trough and you can explain it you might explain it through staff shortages or where you started a new pdsa cycle that really took off and worked or tanked um, and where the impact of the change can be seen on the chart <clears throat> so we've taken you through a couple of the drivers for implementing quality improvement project and again, we'll share this slide deck with you and the resources. You can read the framework for improving quality yourself. And on our website, we have a number of resources and tools that can support you for implementing, for, for looking at each of the drivers for implementing a QI project. So to wrap up, I'm very quickly going to just bring you through a couple of slides showing you some of the resources we have that you might be interested in looking at. First, we have our prospectus of QPS education and learning programs. Um, the first half of it is all the programs that have been developed and delivered by our directorate team. They're on quality improvement, incident management, human factors, clinical audit. They show you how you can apply the dates that they're on, if it's available, um, CPT credits as well. It also signs post you to other quality and patient safety education from other teams, for example, national governance and risk and change and innovation. We have a number of tools, coaching, advising, and bespoke support that we do. I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but again, we have the toolkit I mentioned already. We have a terms and concepts guide, um, like a, a, a glossary of terms, basically, uh, for QI used in the Irish healthcare context. We're developing an improvement collaborative handbook to guide services and how they can run collaboratives. Uh, we've been working with a number of national clinical programs, including the program for stroke, for sepsis, for the deteriorating patient. We've been looking at clinical handovers, at falls, um, at pressure ulcers, basically all of the high-risk patient safety um, areas that are outlined in the patient safety strategy. We have a number of publications on our website. We have some great podcasts you might want to listen to, um, and we have some informational videos as well. Finally, we would highly recommend you consider joining the Q community. So the Q community is a community of over 5,000 people across the UK and Ireland collaborating to improve the safety and quality of healthcare. It's free to apply and become a member. Our national directorate team pays for the license. So anybody who applies, it's free to apply. They have fantastic training, which is free. They have free webinars. They have special interest groups. And they have quite a bit for hospice as well as palliative care on their site where you can connect with people working in similar fields all across the UK and Ireland. So again, you can go out, you can find out more information on our website and we'd be delighted for you to join.